as you see, Wagner is very popular. <laughs> and this is not because his works are easy to approach or easy to understand or even easy to sit through in their full length sometimes. <laughs> We're going to give you a shortened look at one of his great masterpieces, Tristan and Isolde. So, of course, I'm going to give you background on Wagner and the music and everything. But for a minute, I just want to give you an overview of what's going to happen. We're not going to have an intermission today. We'll run this as an hour and a quarter, and then we'll all go have refreshments together. Um, the Santa Fe Concert Association has been doing these Notes on Music series when I talk about Liszt or Schumann or Chopin or Mozart. This is the first time we've had a collaboration, and we're very happy to do this with the newly formed Wagner Society of Santa Fe. So, as Yoko said, there will be more Wagner events. They have not yet been determined. There will also be more concert association events, and they have been determined. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you very quickly that on Thursday and Friday of next week, the Moscow Festival Ballet comes to the Lenzik. That's the 2nd and 3rd of February. On the 7th of February, the wonderful comedy team of Igudisman and Jew come to the Lenzik. On the 16th of February, the great pianist Stephen Huff will do a recital of Beethoven, Scriabin, Liszt, and Huff, his own. Uh, on February 28th, I'll be back here doing an evening of a Rossini with two wonderful singers. Uh, on March 1st, Patti Lapone comes to Santa Fe at the Lenzik. Uh, that may be sold out already, but it's worth a try. Um, the 3rd of March is Apollo's Fire, singing erotic music from Spain and Italy of the 16th century. Okay. Um, <laughs> on the 6th of March, we have the St. Petersburg State Orchestra. On the 13th, excuse me, the 11th of March, the Red Star uh, Dance Ensemble and Chorus. And the season finishes on March 20th with the Swingle Singers at the Lenzik. So all of this is in the little brochures or program books, which you can get after this uh, out in the lobby. So, Richard Wagner, born almost 200 years ago, caused perhaps more change in the world of music and certainly the world of opera than almost any other composer. His beginnings were ordinary in the sense that there was nothing in the first 25 years of Wagner's life and music that suggested he was going to revolutionize the way the world thought about music drama and about music in general. He was the ninth child uh, in a, a poor family. Uh, his father was, was um, the accountant for um, the police department. And um, the, uh, the father died six months after Wagner was born. And his mother remarried a man who was involved with the theater. This was helpful for Wagner because immediately, uh, as soon as he was exposed to theater, he was fascinated by theater. And when he went to school, he was fascinated by Greek drama. When he was 13 or 14, he decided he would teach himself the rules of composition. And at a certain point, uh, he was able to hook up with a teacher who really could take him further in this, but uh, he was quite self-taught. And his interest, as his musical interests developed, was in putting music and words together. So actually, when he was 14, he, he wrote an opera. Um, it's never performed, but <laughs> to attempt to write an opera at the age of 14 is already something. And so Wagner uh, pursued this. By the time he was 21, he'd written three operas. None of them are ever done. This includes uh, Die Feen and Liebesverbot. But gradually, uh, Wagner began to develop a fascination with myth. And he really felt that opera is larger than life. Certainly, Wagner's operas are larger than life. But, <laughs> but he felt that, that all opera deals with archetypes, and so myth was the most naturally suited subject matter for operas. All right, so now we come to the operas that you've heard of, like Rienzi and then The Flying Dutchman, and um, these operas that reach back into history for their subjects. And the, the subjects may even be from legend, so that the actual characters may not have existed. 
Meanwhile, Wagner's personal life is very romantic with a capital R, full of turmoil. He marries an actress named Minna Planer when he's about 25, and um, Wagner has expensive tastes, so he's often in debt, and finally um, the authorities are after him and want to put him in prison, so he and Minna uh, jump on a boat and escape before he's tossed into debtor's prison, and uh, they somehow get to England, but um, he's not very welcome there. In fact, Wagner spends much of the first 50 years of his life fleeing his creditors, okay? Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, he finds time to write uh, these magnificent works of art, and we have to talk now about what makes Wagner different. In the early 1840s, Wagner's living in Paris, and the style that he most admires is Vincenzo Bellini. Uh, he loves the operas of, of Weber. Um, he's heard Fidelio with a wonderful singer who made a great impression on him. But Bellini and the idea of beautiful, long melodies appeals to him. On the other hand, uh, there's a composer named Meyerbeer whom Wagner can't stand because Meyerbeer's large-scale operas are completely successful and everyone in Paris is talking about them and no one is talking about Richard Wagner. <laughs> and for all Wagner's genius, we have to say right away, this is one of the greatest uh, megalomaniacs who has ever lived. Uh, and, and perhaps that's a good thing because uh, megalomania combined with genius provides the necessary drive for the works that the genius has created to be performed. Certainly, Wagner did not lack that drive. He would um, use and abuse all of his friends, uh, both financially and in other ways, to achieve whatever he needed to do in order to get the works that he created out onto the stage. Um, ultimately, Wagner supported himself at first writing um, articles and often in these articles talked about what he saw as the new union of theater and music. To Wagner we owe the fact that the stage was lit in different ways, the fact that the chairs of the audience were all pointed toward the stage, uh, aspects of stagecraft, costuming, production. Wagner thought about all of this. He thought about how an orchestra could be in an orchestra pit instead of at the same level. He even thought about how the pit could be moved at least partially underneath the stage so that it wouldn't interfere with the audience's appreciation of the drama. And ultimately, he thought of how a music drama could be presented so that it never had stops and starts. Even the greatest operas that came before Wagner, whether they were by Mozart or Verdi, had distinct numbers, distinct ensembles, whether they were arias or duets or trios that had a beginning and an end and they might have lasted two minutes or they might have lasted 20 minutes. But Wagner said, no, what if there's never an end until the very end of the whole opera? And he worked to achieve this both dramatically and musically. So you'll see as we start to listen to Tristan and Isolde how he achieved this. Tristan and Isolde appealed to him for a number of specific reasons. First of all, it's a myth, it's a legend. It predates the story of King Arthur and the Round Table. Probably the Tristan legend comes from the 12th century. The version that Wagner read would have been written by Gottfried von Strasbourg around 1210 or 1220. Uh, Wagner seized on it because he said, I have never, this was in a letter to his friend Franz Liszt. Liszt was a friend because Liszt gave Wagner vast sums of money and, and <laughs> supported the Wagner cause very consistently over a long period of time. And uh, Wagner said, I've never found true love, so I've had to create it as a work of art. When I said Wagner was a romantic, I didn't mean just that he loved women, which he certainly did, but he believed that the romantic artist, and again, I'm saying romantic with a capital R, had passions that were beyond the bounds that a human could bear. 
And, and this, was, this was a virtue, right? So suddenly, after the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century, where the clear day of reason was considered an ideal, the Romantics think that the dark underbelly of emotion is what really makes human life worth living. So Wagner is not the only person who felt this way. There were other composers and poets and writers who all believed that exploring all of our most difficult emotions in turmoil was uh, the purpose of art. Essentially, the artist was redefined. The artist had to be someone who was in turmoil, and Wagner certainly you know, personified this in his life. So we have a whole new way of looking at art and the artist. Wagner then sets off to write Tristan and Isolde and does not want to use the musical language that his predecessors, even the ones he loved like Beethoven and Weber and Bellini, used. But he finds a musical language which never reaches a cadence, a moment of technical discussion. <coughs> If a piece goes on for a minute or two and then goes we know that it's over and we clap. <laughs> Wagner makes sure that when it's almost over that it goes and leads off somewhere else so that we can't clap. And so he's able to suspend the moment of finality in his operas uh, for hours. <laughs> I, <laughs> Now confess it, you're all here, so we do love this man, even though, even though sometimes you're sitting there and you think, wow, this just goes on and on and on. <laughs> and yet, uh, well, Bernard Shaw said, um, Wagner has, has um, you know, very, uh, very long, he says there, there are wonderful moments and very long 15 minutes, <laughs> I think he said. But the, the other tool that Wagner used to keep the audience engaged is something that um, we now call the light motif, the leading motive. And what is a leading motive? It's a very small unit of maybe three or four notes, 10 notes, that can recur hundreds of times and is a compositional glue that binds a gigantic work together. So although you couldn't possibly memorize Tristan and Isolde after you're hearing it for the first time, you would undoubtedly leave the theater having memorized some of these tiny musical motifs that recur over and over. And Wagner uses this as a technique. How can a composer, after all, create structure in a work which is four hours of music? You can't rely on sonata form anymore. So paradoxically, the longer the work is, the smaller the units are that hold it together. Because Tristan and Isolde is a story about love, the uh, most important motifs are the motif of their love, and then the motif of longing. You'll notice that in both of these motifs, there are notes that are adjacent to each other chromatically. Ya -di -di and ya -da -di -di. That means that there are no notes in between them on a piano. For all of Wagner's innovations, he did not introduce the quarter tone, but I suppose if he had the chance, he probably would have done that too, because Wagner stopped at nothing to create what he needed. If the orchestra of 1860 didn't have the instruments that he required, he invented new instruments. He really did that. If the theaters that existed didn't have the pit or the stage that he required, he built a new theater. He did that too. So Wagner was someone who realized his dreams even if they didn't exist already. Sometime around 1850, Wagner came in contact with the works of Arthur Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer had a tremendous influence on Wagner, and Schopenhauer believed that human beings have pain because they want things. Schopenhauer said, a person can do what they want, but they can't want what they want. 
What you want is built into you somehow and there's nothing you can do to control it. You have urges, you have desires, and that will ultimately cause you suffering. So Wagner, who felt that part of being an artist was being a suffering artist, uh, naturally felt that Schopenhauer was saying um, we could strive for detachment but never realize it. So Tristan and Isolde is an opera about obsession. The absolute inability to free oneself from the longing for love, love of every kind, sexual love, spiritual love, complete and total absorbed obsessive love. The story goes like this. There are lots of versions of the story that came from the chivalric times, but the version that Wagner writes, and Wagner always writes his own words, as you know, starts with Tristan and Isolde on a ship. The ship is bound from Ireland to Cornwall. Isolde is an Irish princess. Tristan's uncle rules in Cornwall, and Tristan is going to bring his uncle a bride. The bride is Isolde. Isolde doesn't want to be there. But there's some backstory here, which fortunately Wagner didn't include or the opera would be seven hours long. <laughs> so the backstory, in short, is this. Ireland and Cornwall have struggled with one another for decades. There was a warrior, a giant in some legends, named Morolt. Tristan is the only knight brave enough to slay Morolt, and he does. But Morolt is engaged to an Irish princess named... Isolde. Yes! And Isolde, having just lost her fiancé, has the opportunity to kill the man who has killed her fiancé. But instead, he looks into her eyes. And at that moment, she makes another choice. She decides, because she comes from a line of sorceresses, to use her healing arts to save his life. Now, she doesn't know right away who he is because Tristan changes his name, switching the two syllables around, to Tantris. See, Tris, Tan, Tantris. And um, she doesn't get this right away. But <laughs> she figures it out. She figures it out soon enough that if she had wanted to do him in, she could have done it. And she doesn't. All right. So now she's on a ship with Tristan. And Tristan is ignoring her, but is instead taking her to his uncle so that she can marry him. All right, now I told you she's from a line of sorceresses. And her mother has packed her bag not only with dresses, but a couple of potions. Her mother knows that Isolde may not really love King Mark. That's Tristan's uncle. And if this love doesn't happen naturally, she's included a love potion so that King Mark and Isolde can take this potion and love one another. But if it's really bad, she's included another potion, <laughs> which is a death potion. So Isolde has all of this at the ready, and she tells Brangaena, her confidant and attendant, to go get Tristan and bring Tristan down so that they can speak one last time before they reach Cornwall and King Mark. Tristan doesn't want to come, but Brangaena eventually forces him to go see Isolde. And Isolde says, the least that you can do is drink with me because we know what our past is and who knows what our future will be. Well, they both know because Tristan knows that this is a death potion Isolde gives the cup to Tristan, Tristan drinks from it, Isolde drinks from it, and guess what? Brangaena, the faithful maid, has switched out the death <laughs> potion for the love potion because she can't bear to see this happen under her watch. And so, suddenly, Tristan and Isolde, who should be enemies, look at one another, and after a Wagnerian pause of considerable length and several light motifs <laughs> throw themselves into each other's arms just as all the sailors are singing, oh, here we come, it's Cornwall and King Mark is waiting to see his bride, his bride who is now hopelessly, chemically and obsessively in love with Tristan. 
okay. So needless to say, this doesn't turn out well. But King Mark welcomes them. This is act two. King Mark goes out with a hunting party. I'm going to keep the story short. <laughs> King Mark is gone. King Mark has a faithful servant named Melot. Melot has pretended to be Tristan's friend, but in fact is looking for a chance to betray Tristan. So Melot knows the signal. Isolde has told Brungaina, once the hunting party is gone, turn off the torches. That will be Tristan's signal to come and be with me. Isolde puts the torch out herself in the end. Tristan comes, they sing a gorgeous half hour long love duet. <laughs> Not all about erotic love, but about philosophy. I mean, they really get to know each other. This. So Isolde and Tristan are just consummating this as Melot brings King Mark back so that he can see everything. King Mark, who feels much more affection to Tristan, his favorite nephew, than he does to Melot, pretty much just throws Melot aside and says, thanks a lot. Uh, meanwhile, he's very serious about saying to Tristan, how could you betray me in this way, you who were my favorite? And Tristan says, I can't explain it in a way that you could possibly understand. But then he says to Isolde, I'm going to have to go and I want to know if you're willing to follow me wherever I go. Now, of course, Tristan is referring to the realm of death. And the love potion is so strong that Isolde knows that she will follow him even into death. And she says, absolutely, no question. So Melot is infuriated by this. He draws, he strikes Tristan, who just drops his sword and lets him do it, because at this point it is in the hands of fate. Third and final act. Tristan is now at his castle in Brittany with his loyal friend and servant, Courvenal. Courvenal is attending him, but nothing that anyone can do will make Tristan's wound heal. He hopes that before he dies, Isolde will come to see him. There's a shepherd boy playing a pipe, playing a melancholy, slow pipe melody. And Corvinal says, if you see the ship, play a happy tune so that we know. And just as Tristan is about to go, the shepherd boy plays that tune and Tristan revives, sings for 20 minutes, and <laughs> in comes Isolde, just in time to see Tristan die. A second ship comes quickly after Isolde's ship. It's Brongaina, Melot, and King Mark. Brongaina has explained everything to King Mark. King Mark is ready to forgive them because he understands love potions and how you can't really do anything about them. So this is a moment where King Mark, completely forgiving, is ready to unite Tristan and Isolde, but he's too late. Courvenal, in rage, raises his sword against Melot. The two of them struggle for a moment. They kill each other. Uh, Tristan says Isolde dies. And Isolde, left alone, remembers her promise to follow Tristan. So she sings one of the most glorious, beautiful pieces of music ever written uh, over Tristan's dead body and dies going with him. And finally, the musical line, which began five hours ago, concludes on a beautiful B major chord. And, and, and the opera is finally over. Okay, so Wagner really keeps the suspense and the suspension of any kind of resolution, not theatrical or harmonic, until that last moment. Now, Wagner, as you've already heard, didn't want to do anything the way anyone else had done it. And the same is true of the singers that he requires for his operas. Wagner's operas are like gigantic symphonies, uh, both in length and in size of orchestra. And sometimes the orchestra is the main character and sometimes the singer is the main character. But the singers, in any case, have to be singers who have the stamina and the strength and the power to uh, project these larger-than-life characters with larger-than-life emotions over a gigantic orchestra. 
So we're incredibly fortunate today that we have with us Jean-Michel Chabonnet, who has sung the role of Isolde all over the world, and she's going to sing several excerpts from this opera. The first thing we're going to do is uh, after, you probably um, remember I told you that this was the motive of the love, and this was the motive of longing, and in between there's a chord. If we put all three of these motives together, we get This sets the stage for the drama. Isolde and Brongena are on the ship. They are almost to Cornwall. Brongena says, there's Cornwall's green shore. And Isolde, in the outburst that you're about to hear, says, why did sorceresses demote themselves so that now all we do is create healing potions. Why can't we make the whole ocean rise up, swallow this damn ship and everybody on it, cast them down to the bottom of the ocean where they belong? Oh, how weak I feel now as one of these modern 12th century sorceresses. <laughs> and um, so she curses the whole ship and hopes that all of them will go down. So right away, Wagner shows us uh, a character of tremendous power and passion and strength. So Jean-Michel, will you join us, please? I'm going to sing the part of Brangena. Yes, my faithful servant. <laughs> if Beethoven had written this aria, she would have sung, Vende zum Lohn. Right? 
and we could have clapped. But in fact, what Wagner does is... Uh, So that's the technique that I'm talking about where he doesn't allow you to have any relief from the ongoing tension in the drama. The actual first voice you hear when Tristan and Isolde begins is a sailor who's up in the rigging and he sings, Frisch weht der Wind der Heimat zu. That's his little light motif. And You'll hear So Wagner will take that tiny little unit and use it a dozen times, a hundred times, a thousand times as the harmony changes, as the color changes. You might have noticed, or you might have been just so overwhelmed by the power of her singing, that while Isolde is singing that, the longing motif is playing in the orchestra. In fact, as you hear a Wagner opera, you hear the same motifs over, over, and over, but used in so many different ways. Sometimes one is completely unaware that they're happening, but this is the compositional basis for everything the man wrote. Um, for example, in the second act, I told you they sang a magnificent love duet. Uh, it goes something like, So stirben wir um ungetrennt, ewig einig ohne End, o erwachen, ohne erwangen. So this becomes another motif of their love always rising, becoming more and more impassioned. At another point uh, in the second act, you'll hear a motif that sounds something like this. Hang on. So this will also recur in a very important way later in the opera. But the most recurrent, frequent, over and over motif is this single chord, which, uh, not surprisingly, has been the Tristan chord. It's come to be known as the Tristan chord. What's so special about this chord? What indeed is so special about a lot of these chords is that they are diminished sevenths or half diminished sevenths that do not belong to any particular key. Uh, of course, there are plenty of major and minor chords in Tristan and Isolde and in all of Wagner's operas, but so often he takes us to these chords which forgive the technical discussion again, very short, because they they're built up uh, on minor thirds that don't necessarily lead to a particular place. Uh, they are floating chords. They're, they're mercenaries. They can, they can work for any key almost that you want them to work for. So, so Wagner uses these as part of his technical compositional arsenal to prevent us from feeling that we've settled in a key. If you were uh, taking that wonderful piece that Jean-Michel just sang and uh, sort of analyzing it, you will notice that um, this is a half diminished seventh where we begin. This is a diminished seventh where we end. All diminished sevenths so that we never settle So these diminished sevenths, which are normally only places we pass in traditional classical music to arrive at major or minor chords, become the points of arrival. So even our points of arrival have no home. This is Wagner's restless soul. Now, Wagner's restless soul 
fell in love with a woman named Matilda Weisendonck. He was married to Minna Planner, you remember that? And it turned out that Herr Weisendonck was a very wealthy Swiss merchant and a friend of Wagner's. So because they were friends, Wagner assumed that his wife was part of the package. And <laughs> he, he and Matilda Weisendonck had a very intense affair. Matilda Weisendonck was a poet. She wrote five poems that he set to music, and two of them actually have music that then figured into Tristan and Isolde. Wagner never said this explicitly, but everyone assumes that Tristan and Isolde was inspired largely because of his love for Mathilde Weisendonck, a love that he couldn't fully consummate. Um, the character of King Mark, as I said, is very sympathetic, and Tristan and King Mark have a lot of affection for each other. This was the parallel to Wagner's life because Wagner had a lot of affection for Mathilde Weisendonck's husband, um, and, and so it wasn't a conflict in Wagner's mind to present this, uh, this love affair as being inevitable. You know, the potion made me do it, or whatever. <laughs> and, and, um, and so uh, King Mark, in the end, although it's too late, understands, forgives, and would have united Tristan and Isolde. This didn't happen with the Weisendonck family, but Wagner imagined that it should have. And as I've said, Wagner was a person who believed that what was possible in his imagination should be possible to realize in real life. Uh, often he was frustrated in this. But uh, as, as an artist, he succeeded completely, even though as a man, he was frustrated frequently in that. But I think that the, the, the reality is that Wagner created his own rules uh, and again, Schopenhauer influenced him. Schopenhauer said, talent is when somebody can aim at a target and hit it when other people can't hit the target. Maybe it's far away, maybe, you know, whatever. But he said, genius is when the person can hit the target and nobody else can even see the target. <laughs> and, and that is what Wagner took as a motto for his own artistic life. He saw a target that wasn't even visible to anybody else, and he not only went after it, but he was able to hit it. He was able to create it. So let's just look at what Wagner can do when he combines uh, these light motifs. Somebody tell me where we are in terms of the grand scheme. Good, okay. This is the opening of the third act. Tristan is with his friend Corvinal at his castle in, Cor in uh, Brittany. And as I said, there's a shepherd boy playing a plaintive melody. The shepherd is just playing that little triplet on his pipe. Yup, up, up, bee, da. Wagner, the great orchestrator. Suddenly, the celli take this up. Any time you hear a melodic fragment in Wagner, you're going to hear it again but you're going to hear it transfigured. 
you're going to hear it in a way that it has a whole different meaning. Many of you are going to go to the film at the screen. Um, the way to watch and listen to a Wagner opera with its greater than life length is to listen to those tiny motivic figures because suddenly you're hypnotized and drawn into this world where they happen again and again, but always with a new meaning. It's amazing because an hour and 20 minutes can go by like that when you get drawn into this world. <coughs> Wagner went back to the medieval German romances, as I said, for his source material. And I know you know some of the other great Wagner operas drawn from that same period, like uh, Parsifal and Tannhäuser and Lohengrin, the Meistersinger, the, the, and, and most of all the, the four-part Ring of the Nibelung, uh, the, the Rheingold and the Walküre and the Siegfried and the Götterdämmerung. So in all of these operas, he is exploring myth, but really Tristan and Isolde is unique. It's the only opera which is an exploration of passionate love. Wagner considered, instead of Parsifal, that his last opera would be about Buddha because he was fascinated, as I said, with Schopenhauer's idea that we become unhappy and suffer because we want things. And so he thought an opera about Buddha would be the ultimate way to uh, deal with that question. But finally, sticking with his aesthetic of uh, German myth, he went back to that Parsifal myth and was able to achieve the same things. We can't talk about Wagner without touching on the anti-Semitism that now we know was part of Wagner's approach to the world. And what I found is that Wagner was most anti-Semitic when Meyerbeer became a more famous composer. <laughs> that there are, <laughs> there are more evil people in the world than Richard Wagner. Uh, you know, he, he certainly, um, would say and do anything, but truthfully, uh, Meyerbeer had supported Wagner and they were friends at an earlier point. Meyerbeer um, gave Wagner money, who didn't, right? Uh, so it was, it was only because Meyerbeer had the audacity to be more successful with Le Prophet in 1850 uh, than Wagner had been with Lohengrin that, that made Wagner write uh, this, this despicable article called uh, Jews in Music, Judentum in, de, in der Musik. And um, I think that, that although um, Cosima, who, well, we'll get to her, <laughs> there, there, were, there were certainly more rabid uh, anti-Semites. Wagner's um, morality existed only in as much as it affected the production of his works and the realizations of his artistic dreams. So amoral, certainly. Um, a person who, who devoted their lives to, to trying to um, wipe out Jews, no, he was not that. Uh, that Hitler seized upon Wagner's music and said, this is true German music, uh, we can't lay that at Wagner's feet, it's not Wagner's fault. Um, Wagner said he wanted a German race that didn't exist yet. It was essentially a German race that would want to spend all their time and energy supporting the kind of operas that only he wrote. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't really a political agenda. It wasn't an ethnic agenda. It was a Wagner agenda. And, and this is both his, his, uh, his downfall, but also his strength, because in his life, he was able to achieve these things. He was able to, um, even come out of debt. <laughs> when Wagner was almost 50, uh, you know, he, as I say, was quite a writer and he had a, a public platform where people really uh, read what he had to say. He wrote, there should be a prince, and this was in an era where suddenly the middle class was becoming very strong. There should be a prince who would underwrite the great artistic outpourings of a society, by which he meant himself. <laughs> Guess what? 
King Ludwig, who was 17, read that, contacted Wagner. Wagner went to Munich, and uh, Ludwig said, I'm going to pay off all your debts, and uh, what else do you need? <laughs> so in the end, Ludwig paid you know, half a million, a huge amount to Wagner, and only when his court began to think that Wagner would have too much influence politically, which Wagner never wanted, was King Ludwig forced in 1865, when Wagner was 53, to get Wagner out of Munich. But King Ludwig came through later. So suddenly, after this life of being a debtor, uh, constantly in danger of being imprisoned by his creditors, Wagner finds, as if by magic, a patron who will not only support him, but encourages him to realize whatever his artistic dreams are. So uh, Wagner was very fortunate, and it's thanks to Ludwig that we have the later operas and that Bayreuth exists. It's thanks to Franz Liszt and some other people as well, but obviously Ludwig had the means and the desire to support Wagner in a way that nobody else had. So, as I said, the affair with Matilda Wesendonck did not last, but Wagner had another great love. And this was Liszt's daughter, Cosima. Now, Cosima, unfortunately, was married to Hans von Bülow, <laughs> one of the greatest conductors who conducted the music of Liszt and conducted the music of Wagner. He was a great pianist. Everybody thought he was one of the uh, highest musical aristocrats of Europe. And when he and Cosima had their first child and she said, um, let us name her Isolde, he didn't figure out. <laughs> In fact, it was not his child. And the next two children were named Eva and Siegfried. They weren't his children either. And finally, uh, Cosima confessed everything to von Bülow. And von Bülow said, at least you are having these children with one of the greatest men who has ever lived. <laughs> Go figure. So he makes this sacrifice. Cosima, who is 24 years younger than Wagner, moves in with Wagner, and they remain married for the rest of Wagner's life. So Cosima really was uh, a vicious person, and uh, her anti-Semitism outstripped Wagner's by a long way. Uh, it is she who really is responsible for some of the bad rap that Wagner gets in that department. However, as a couple, uh, she gave him incredible strength, and so uh, we, we have to thank Cosima for many things. She enabled him to continue with uh, Meisterzinger and Parsifal, and, you know, ultimately, a, a great genius creating these works, it should be judged for the works. Um, Wagner was clearly someone who didn't feel that, um, uh, someone's wife was their personal property, was um, nevertheless able to create things that I think transcended who he might have been uh, as, as a mortal human being. And um, the ideas that he returns to again and again in his operas are ideas that he'd had as a younger man and finally is able to realize in the operas. So, at the end of Tristan and Isolde, the idea that Isolde's will is so strong and her love is so overwhelming that she has made a promise to Tristan that she's going to die with him so that their love can never be separated, is realized not only dramatically but musically. And you'll hear as we do this final aria from Tristan and Isolde, the Liebestod, the love death, you'll hear many of the leitmotifs that we've talked about already. You'll hear... You'll hear this. You'll hear... And you'll hear the... Um, It's as if Wagner not only brings the love, the lovers together, but brings together all of the musical children uh, that he's introduced us to through the course of this incredible opera. So once again, Jean-Michel, 
we're going to do the Liebestod from the end of Tristan and Isolde.
What I think many of you know is that tomorrow Jean-Michel gets on a plane and she goes into rehearsal to sing the role of Isolde at the Dallas Opera <laughs> with Clifton Forbes as Tristan and there will be four performances in the latter part of February. So it's not so far away, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to go over to Dallas, I think it opens February 16th, 16th yes. and goes through the 28th, 9th? 25th. Fifth is the last 25th. show. And then I get on a plane and go to Germany to sing. <laughs> <laughs> so she has sung 10 minutes of the role for you today. But the thing that really unites Tristan and Isolde is they both love to sing really loud. And you have to imagine <laughs> over the course of four hours, most of the singing is Isolde. Yeah. And so what is it like to sing that way for two hours? <laughs> Over I'm a gigantic a orchestra. I'm a singer that likes to sing longer, so let's do it all again. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, you're transported with the music. As Joe's told you about Wagner's story, even just hearing little bits, I get taken into it. And when I'm in a part like this, and this part in particular for me, I join the orchestra, I join this whole world. One thing that Wagner did that no other composers really did was each piece that he wrote was its own world. The, vocal, the musical language he used is very unique to that piece. The themes are obviously unique. And I join them. And I but does that fly. give you like physical strength? It gives or physical stamina? strength, emotional strength. And it gives you, I don't know, for me a piece like this is, so, it's a very spiritual experience. Very Santa Fe of me to say. But it's, <laughs> I have to be would very have connected. approved completely. Yes, yeah. and I, I have to be really connected with everything to do these kind I, of parts. I think what I'd really like to do is say, let's have questions for a little bit, because I think we have a few minutes left. So it would probably, 10 minutes, that's perfect. Can you just say a sentence or two about orchestration, Wagner's orchestration? Yes. Wagner regarded the orchestra, as I said, as a soloist. So in his orchestration, he chose colors that represent different feelings uh, you, can, you can point to spots in Mozart and say, here that oboe playing one dissonant note is a heart-rending, beautiful thing. But in Wagner, he takes that idea a hundred times farther. So uh, quite apart from the sheer size of the orchestra is the fact that he's using orchestral color to represent emotion. He's using specific instruments to represent specific characters or emotions so that uh, the whole orchestra is a character. Once Wagner did that, the world could not go back to, to the way, you know, Handel or, or uh, other wonderful composers used the orchestra. You can say Verdi wrote great operas, but you cannot say there was anything specifically orchestrally uh, significant about it. It's great, but it, it doesn't say, I'm going to distinguish between what a flute means and what a viola means. Wagner, on the other hand, used all these resources, and as I say, he wasn't content with the existing instruments, so he invented the Wagner tubas to create the effect that he wasn't able to create from the existing instruments. When he had Bayreuth built, thank you, King Ludwig, he made sure that the orchestra was sitting underneath the stage and this otherworldly sound would come up, not right in front of the audience, between the audience and the stage, but actually from behind. So the orchestra became like the soul of the opera, not always visible, but always uh, essential. And he had to do that because he also used much larger orchestras than anyone had in the Yeah, past, huge. Which is a big difference to Verdi, to Wagner. Right. Jean-Michel. Darling. It's obvious from the words <coughs> that you are connected to the entire opera. But is there any particular part that really is your favorite, that moves you the most, that you look forward to singing? I have to say, of course, the Liebestod after the whole night is the most magic moment of all. But I really love the part he played, the love duet with Tristan. I love how he weaves the voices and the orchestra. And to me, the orchestra is, is multiple voices. It's not one soloist. Mm -hmm. It's another f hundred soloists <laughs> uh, into the voices. But when we get to the point where we sit down, usually, and we sing 
so stürbe nicht. That to me is also one of the just most incredible moments. This might be touching on a sensitive area. And I know you know that opera. <laughs> this may be touching on a sensitive area. But how important is it who your Tristan is and how much you connect with him? I consider myself an actor and I find a way to connect with all different Tristans. And I've had Tristans that were older than my grandfather and four times as large. <laughs> and I have one I've sung with a lot who's a fabulous singer who's about this tall and he's a block with a block head on top of it. Um, but as that particular Tristan, whom I adore as a human being, said to me, he said, when you look at me on stage, it's like no one's looked at me like that since I was in college. His wife. <laughs> and I said, but it ends when I leave the stage. <laughs> just so we're clear. Edgar, you had a question. You talked about life motif. You just played Rigoletto, and the phrase that you played Rigoletto was used throughout. As a light motif. As a light motif. Yes. Which Verdi took. From Wagner. And OK, so Rigoletto, Rigoletto was written in the very early 1850s, shortly after Lohengrin and Tannhäuser. Verdi had huge respect for Wagner, but he said, I keep him at a great distance. Because for Verdi, he said, this Germanic, fantastical way of thinking uh, will never be the way to reach us Italians who are basically simple. <laughs> However, as you absolutely correctly point out, uh, Verdi took what was simple enough that uh, his audiences would grasp it. And, and as I say, once Wagner began to transform the world of opera, there was no turning back. So the fact that what initially is the Duke's song, uh, when he says women are changeable, becomes in the final act of Rigoletto the motif that the jester hears off stage that makes him know he hasn't had uh, the Duke killed, he's had his own daughter killed. So yeah, uh, Wagner's influence extended to Verdi even though Verdi was very cautious and, and, and kept personal. They were born in the same year, by the way. They were completely contemporary, both born in 1813. But Verdi, Verdi kept his respectful distance all of his life. Yes, sir. I have a, a two-part question, if I may. You may. <laughs> okay. First of all, I'm just curious about the, the diminished, the half. The, the half diminished. diminished. The diminished seven with the half. You know, but who of the contemporaries were using this? And I noticed there's some in there that have a flat ninth. And that also happens, which is less rare, by the way. That you could find all the way through Bach and. Uh, but the, the, the half diminished seventh, of course, was used by all these composers. You can't look at a work by Bizet or Meyerbeer or whatever and not find it, uh, or, or even ear earlier. But it's Wagner's insistence upon it and his use of it as an arrival point rather than as a passing point that makes this musical language so different. Many people have said Tristan is the work that is the changing point from traditional harmony to modern music. Now, no single work can bear that responsibility. But you can see why a work where the arrival points have no specific key paves the way for atonality or all kinds of other musical languages that are not key dependent. And you had a second question. So, and then, thank you for that, by the way, because uh, I'm a jazz musician, so I well, we all we all we owe jazz to Wagner, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, yeah. And the Plaintiff song there was that supposed to have been based on some kind of folkloric thing as a player? I don't think so. I think that, like a lot of other music, do you know the answer to that? I think it is not an actual tune. It's not an actual he, he tune. But but I think that uh, like the, the other Sailor composers song too have found ways to make things that sound like vernacular, although they're actually original, original compositions. Like uh, Wagner, ha I'll get you in one second. He has a hunting tune. You remember I said King Mark and all of his hunters go out. So there's this. Well, actually, that's a big ninth chord too, isn't it? So, so hunters didn't really play jazz chords. But, <laughs> but Wagner takes something that is motivic, uses a hunting tune, and then incorporates it into his own richer harmonic world. Sir. Thank you. 
effect of it's clever, right? I'm just interested also in the effect of Tristan at the time it was written. I mean, we've heard much of it now uh, again, although it, you made it terrifically fresh. I mean, they claim to grow tenors insane. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm and died, they, right? I, tenors actually I, died singing it, yeah. I've got a few of those. Headaches, women passed out. Another right, man. right, right, right. When they, when they did this, uh, I mean, even today it has a tremendous power. I just ask you, when you sing it or you conduct it or play it, does it still have that power to you? To not, I don't want anyone to go insane. But <laughs> <laughs> or die. Uh, can you shall I? Please. I think that, that it's a very good question. We don't go insane or die, but really the handful of people that sing this repertoire is very specialized because it takes incredible stamina, as we know, much longer than anything that had been written. Well, Meyerbeer did that before. Very long operas. But, but Meyerbeer had more everything. characters more and characters. gave everybody a break. Um, <laughs> and uh, the orchestra is so huge. And then, of course, emotionally, it's a, it takes you to a different place, which is probably why they went crazy and died. The <laughs> other thing that, uh, one sec, everybody recognized when they heard this opera with its surging and its chromaticism and its rich harmonies that it was sexual. That was clear. Uh, Clara Schumann heard it and she said his, his unbridled and overt sexuality kills this piece because you know there, there, were, there were different kinds of romantics. Uh, there were the romantics like Brahms and Schumann who were looking back over their shoulders at a classicism, capital C classical kind of music writing, and doing their best to blend those two. Then there were the composers like Wagner and Liszt who really only were moving away. Not that they didn't have huge admiration for Beethoven, they did but they did not want to try to blend those. They wanted to forge their own paths. And in Wagner's case, uh, finding this sensual musical language was a key part of what he was exploring in, in the fullest way that he could. Yes, sir. I heard that he's taken a break from the writing of the ring so that he could try to earn some money with the more Yes. <laughs> well, I don't think that it was that it was more popular. The ring has the most amazing gestation in that he wrote the four operas, libretto first, in reverse order. So Siegfried's Tod, which we now know as Goethe Dämmerung, came in the 18, late 1840s. And, and, and the whole poem was written, and, and he published the set uh, just as literature with not a note of music to make some money. So how long did it take for audiences to appreciate Tristan? Well, 18, okay, so the work itself was finished, composed finished, in 1859. It wasn't put on until six years later in 1865 with Bulow, thank you very much, the, <laughs> the former husband of his wife, uh, conducting because the singer said this is impossible, the orchestra said this is unplayable. Uh, so before we even get to the public, we have the musicians themselves saying, this is crazy, what, what, what is he thinking? So it took a long time for Wagner's works to come to reality. So, uh, when it comes to the two um, diminished chords that you mentioned, you mentioned the minor third having a play. Well, okay. But, but, but you heard my feelings because you didn't mention the tritone, I, okay. which I think has even more. But what is a tritone? It's two, it's it's two, two minor thirds, right? Okay. So here's a diminished seventh. And the thing about diminished sevenths, sorry, all of you who don't care about this, but I'll do it fast. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's 12 major chords, there's 12 minor chords. You know, if you split an octave into X pieces, there'll be X major chords. But there'll only be three diminished chords because this one, this one, and this one is all we got because then we're back to the first one. That's why I say they can serve so many purposes, they can go to so many things. The tritone is the addition of two minor thirds. And uh, even as long ago as Plato, he said, that is an immoral interval and will cause, <laughs> right? He wrote that down just so you wouldn't mess around with immoral intervals. <laughs> and the tritone is crucial to this. But Wagner was trying to write something, not immoral, but something well, that, that was in, <laughs> insatiable <laughs> a longing that would not be resolved. Tristan and Isolde's love is only resolved in death. 
Wagner didn't include this in the opera, but the old legends say that although they were buried in separate graves at King Mark's insistence, the plants, the vines growing out of the graves intertwined. So that, that uh, tritone only gets resolved after death. <clears throat> Yeah. I'm shortening the overture. So we're, we're not in a key. Nicest 12 tone melody ever written. the B major at the end of the, what Tovey called the most beautifully orchestrated B major chord ever written. So that's the 60 second version of Tristan and Isolde for people <laughs> in a hurry. <laughs>